happened. ICT is all about the spirit that I'm wearing, you know. It, 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 who could have thought of it 10 years back that you would be measuring everything? You would also have a sleep pattern being measured on a device that is then uploading it onto a cloud platform where you would very soon see perhaps ads popping up for sleeping pills if you want to see people at that point or something else. So this is the power of ICT. We've seen that uh, there are essential patents that are uh, existing in ICT. These patents get uh, pooled and uh, these then get licensed as per very well-known brand terms. We have companies that open up their proprietary interfaces to offer licensing terms and we then see that licensing facilitates a kind of a collaboration. It improves uh, compliance, it improves security capabilities and it also improves customer satisfaction because uh, uh, now there is just one device that I'm carrying. I do not need to carry a mobile and uh, an iPad or a uh, so each device in itself is actually more than three to four products that you are carrying at one point in time. And therefore ICT and licensing within ICT becomes extremely critical and important. There are several models that are followed for licensing within the sector. Uh, it's also important to understand uh, uh, how the licensing then contributes to the value uh, uh, the VAP, which I am not sure if you read the news reports recently. Ericsson uh, licensed its patents to, and you know, that we see a direct impact on the share value of uh, the company. We've seen almost a 7% increase in the share value of Ericsson having licensed its patents. We've seen that, you know, there are other companies like Qualcomm who are now licensing patents to Xiaomi, and again, there was almost about a 7% increase in the share value, and this is uh, as recent as 2015 December. So that is the kind of value uh, a licensing models brings in to the company. And therefore it is important for companies to evaluate what kind of licensing models would they want to practice. Uh, uh, increasingly, the consumers and the end users, the enterprises are pressed for uh, budgets. They have shrinking IT budgets and therefore it's important for uh, solution providers to be able to work as partners with these enterprises and offer value-based pricing. Uh, mostly in this sector, the licensing is moving from a perpetual upfront license to a recurring term-based license, which is more in terms of support and development piece than perhaps an upfront license. And uh, for that to be sustainable, you have to be able to keep on adding value to the product. And again, that takes us back to R&D, that takes us back to be able to license, that takes us back to be able to uh, integrate from other existing um, companies and technologies in the market and improvise the product offering to your customers. So uh, I wouldn't get into details of these are very uh, standard models that are followed in the sector for uh, you know software as a service. Mostly these are revenue sharing arrangements. These could work with uh, an upfront license along with revenue sharing. These could be pay per use. And some of these models are extremely important because they also then have the ability to bring upfront as a subscriber uh, companies and customers who were otherwise not able to afford the kind of heavy licensing fees upfront. Well, so every business wants to expand and every business wants to expand in a way that, uh, you know, they are able to make more money and they are able to uh, sort of uh, keep the competitors out, they are able to increase the market share. When we do that, we have to be extremely careful with how we do the licensing because in, in, our, in our efforts to be able to capture more of the market share, in our efforts to be able to expand the business, get more revenues out of the product, we shouldn't land ourselves in troubles that uh, you know could be avoided if we were to structure our agreements and understand some of the issues beforehand a little better. And therefore, um, you know, this brings us to how we should construct our agreements, how we should look at some of the important issues in licensing that we should be very conscious and mindful of when we try to uh, expand on the business. Typically, 
the negotiations um, go on for a sustained period of time. They, there are uh, several layers that are involved into the negotiations. These are not just one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, negotiations. There are several teams within an organization that are involved with these kind of negotiations. And therefore, it becomes important for us to understand as in-house councils beforehand what is the reason for license. You know, it could be strategic, it could be market share, it could be competitive issues, it could be the, uh, you know, revenues, it could be something else. And therefore, to keep that primary thing in focus is extremely important. It's also important then for us to do some kind of due diligence around documents and data from the other side and uh, uh, you know do also some due diligence on the consumers or the uh, enterprise that you're licensing it to then you should be very mindful of who would constitute the negotiating team within your organization uh, many of the times um, and this is my personal experience too in many of the companies uh, what we see is that uh, a negotiation is almost sealed almost sealed and that is the time when the paperwork hits the legal team, you know, and the lawyers are asked to draft up something which they would turn back and say, uh, isn't just possible. It's just not possible to do it for various reasons. There could be reasons on the competition side, there could be reasons on pricing, revenue structures, etc. But, you know, you don't want those kind of frustrations at that point in time. And therefore, as companies, it's extremely important for us to understand at what point in time and who would be the people who would be involved in the negotiating team? At what time that negotiation team needs to sort of refer the matters back to an expert either within the company or outside the company and understand how we can leverage it best for benefit of both the parties. So many of the other things here are the standard because you know it is almost obvious that you would want to list down what are your uh, key things from the negotiation, what are your uh, strategic advantages from that kind of negotiation and it, it might just work a little better if we were to sort of create a universal rocket around that, something uh, which is more in uh, lines of a term sheet which gives a clear idea around the things that you want to achieve internally and externally out of that negotiation because that keeps everything extremely focused, targeted and perhaps will have shorter cycles for those negotiations which usually might, um, might be anywhere from 6 months to 18 months. Uh, well, it's important to understand what is the subject matter of the license, it's important to uh, very explicitly list that out because many times you come across agreements and contracts that are extremely long drawn, almost as thick as a thesis and they would nowhere mention what is the subject of that license. Uh, perhaps it would have some vague reference to an extra which would be difficult to trace or it would have some reference to something else which would be created in future and there wouldn't be clear guidelines on what is it that is being licensed. What are the kind of uh, specifications or outputs or deliverables that we are expecting? So if the technology is not fully functional at the time when it is being licensed, it's important for both parties to be able to list down the results that are desired of that contract and of that technology. And it's of course very important to list down or mention or draft into your contract who owns the underlying technology one, what that technology is and then who owns it because as we go along and most of these licenses would be really long term and you know even after the term is over typically they would get renewed year, year after year. So uh, technology is so ever evolving that if you've had an agreement for 10 years you, you started with something and you would see that you after 10 years are seeing a different monster. So you don't want to be in a situation where you would know who holds the rights over what, whatever was developed during the time of the contract. You might also want to specifically list out how those rights would be split, who would own which bit of it. And these things are extremely important. 
you know, we, we don't want to land into situations where uh, we are disputing over who owns which bit of it and how the revenues out of it because most of the times you may also want to enter into a revenue share arrangement around the technology or the sharing of profits from that technology. So you do not want to have a situation where you do not where you do not know how you would split those profits or revenues and in what ratios. Yes, uh, scope of rights and territory is extremely important, exclusive or non-exclusive, of course it's uh, discretionary, it's negotiable, uh, but it's extremely important to keep these things in mind. Uh, we've recently seen in India the classic case of um, Sinogen platform where the Delhi High Court actually put a stop to sale and distribution of one plus one mobile phones in India and uh, all of this if I were to trace back was a very simple licensing arrangement somewhere uh, left very fluid and ambiguous and uh, the whole um, the trouble with the licensing arrangement was that Sinogen had a non-exclusive global arrangement with a Chinese manufacturer whilst in India they entered into an exclusive three-year deal with an Indian mobile manufacturer. And when the Chinese models start hitting India, the Indian manufacturer went to the Delhi High Court and sought an injunction. The Delhi High Court granted that injunction. Of course, later, you know, the case was settled and uh, that was vacated. But having said that, I think all of that cost and all of that time and effort could have been saved if perhaps at some point somebody thought, oh, uh, uh, you know, uh, before they enter into that kind of exclusive uh, three-year uh, arrangement with Microsoft in India, if they thought through and if they did a due diligence of their existing agreements, which was, um, so the existing arrangement was a global non-exclusive one in nature, and through one of the distributors. So, uh, I mean, it's always interesting uh, to see these kind of issues coming up, but uh, the idea is to be able to do a thorough due diligence internally and also to be able to construct the licensing arrangements extremely clearly so that we don't run into these overlapping issues. Uh, well, consideration, of course, is extremely important. And uh, uh, consideration, of course, uh, you know, uh, there are ways of interpreting it. Uh, there are uh, several um, several difficulties as in-house that we face when we construct cons uh, consideration, which is at times not just commercial in nature. And uh, th that is important because, uh, as per the New Contract Act, uh, we all know that it's not only uh, price or money or uh, uh, you know, the dollars that uh, would go into consideration, it's, it's also, it could be other factors, it could be territorial uh, limitations, it could be product limitations, it could be something else, of course, uh, uh, competition issues are separate, but having said that, the construction of the consideration clause has to be extremely careful. This is also very dependent upon the markets that you're in, so if we are in Japan, we know that consideration is not a mandate for a valid contract. So, if you are contracting in Japan, you may want to consider that and you may want to construct it differently or uh, your licensee then may have uh, separate issues which you would want to deal differently with when you deal with a licensee who is based elsewhere where consideration is extremely important for a contract to be valid in a court of law. Uh, payment mode, performance, warranties, indemnities, of course, it comes as naturally as breathing to all of us being lawyers. Uh, uh, we have to be extremely careful about what are the future releases and versions of the product that is being licensed uh, at both ends. Uh, and again, I would go back to the Sinogen case where, uh, uh, you know, uh, because of the dispute, uh, the consumers were the ones who were at loss because uh, the one plus one mobile phone, which was actually an instant hit, uh, it was being sold exclusively through Amazon platform, but was absolutely an instant hit within the Indian consumers. Uh, suddenly, the consumers were left uh, to the mercy of the licensing contract, which was mostly the discretion of the companies involved. And uh, after the Delhi High Court's injunction, Sinogen uh, promised no updates and upgrades to the platform. So the consumers were now stuck with a technology which would not be updated. Later, of course, you know, uh, there was a settlement that was arrived at and all of those issues have been
being resolved, which also then triggered uh, the Chinese manufacturer to develop its own operating system. And I think very recently, uh, a couple of months back, they released the first version of that. So it's important to then understand what are the future releases and versions on both sides on the side of the licensee and the licensor. It's important to understand how the versions and upgrades will be supported throughout, what kind of documentation, know-how consulting and training that goes into it, and um, uh, you know, uh, future relationship, of course, of the parties is important. This mentioned so on solicitation, but you know, uh, parties may just enter into licensing arrangements, and as as we go along, we may realize that you may want to grow it into a joint venture or some other kind of relationship. So those are the things that um, that will form part of your long uh, long drawn strategy, and it, it may just be worth the while to think it all through before you construct your licensing arrangement. You know, because you don't want to be in any legal troubles after you've entered into the arrangement. The settlement of disputes, of course, is is a is a major uh, uh, is a major criteria that uh, I think all of us as lawyers bear in mind when we construct agreements. This is also important because most of us, uh, when we work in the ICT sector, are working in a multi-jurisdictional. Uh, kind of a forum, and uh, when I say multi-jurisdictional kind of forum, it's, it has a direct impact on how the agreements will be uh, interpreted and also how disputes will be settled. So we've seen that you know typically the courts in Germany, and of course my friends here from Germany would uh, be able to throw more um, light on it. But having said that, you know we know that uh, Nokia won the historical. Uh, patent uh, litigations against HTC in Germany. They, uh, they, they've had a tendency to be able to favor uh, the patent uh, patent holder. And uh, whereas, uh, you know, uh, on the other hand, in some other jurisdictions, we see that uh, the courts do not favor injunctions readily. So they may or may not want to grant you a permanent or uh, an entire injunction as soon as you file for it. It will also depend on how you are interpreting. Uh, granting of injunctions with respect to standard essential patents. You know, in uh, Huawei uh, case, uh, the European, uh, the, the Court of Justice, European Union had laid down huge guidelines on how the negotiating around these should be structured and what are the do's and don'ts. So it actually imposed upon the patent holder uh, some kind of um, guidelines on how the patent holder should. Uh, should be able to license to a willing licensee and so on and so forth. And also adding to this, there's a huge cost that goes into litigation. There's a huge, uh, uh, so uh, there's a uh, there's an interesting Stanford University analysis that between 2010 to 2012, uh, about 20 billion US dollars were spent on patent acquisition and patent litigation. And uh, you know, that's amount equal to eight Mars rover missions. So, I mean, if you're talking about ICT being important to economic development, ICT being important to society at large, what are we doing spending $20 billion in patent acquisition and litigation, maybe? I don't know, perhaps that money was better spent elsewhere, or uh, uh, a fraction of it could be invested elsewhere. We've also seen that, uh, uh, you know, uh, we've seen uh, in the case of eBay and Merck Exchange where the parties litigated for almost six years and after that they came to a settlement out of court and uh, uh, you know we've also seen in some of the other cases where uh, 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 this was the case that pertained to the Siri app that all of us have on our iOS. Uh, it's a voice uh, uh, guided um, technology where the original patentee actually won the jury trial in the US and even after that, he had to sell off that patent to the other side. Why? Because he lost more than he could afford in the legal battle. So what's the point of that kind of a victory? You know, if we have to ultimately then sell it off to the person we've been fighting it over with. So it's important to then understand uh, uh, how we construct the dispute resolution clauses. W would you want to rush to a court of law? Would you want to arbitrate, mediate, and use other conciliatory methods? Uh, you know, before you jump to that. And well, in the end, I would like to keep it short. I just hope that 
uh, people are still awake and sort of, uh, you know, up there for the, the other two speakers to come. Thank you so much.